Just right out of the gates, I'll, I'll let you know that uh, we piloted and cut our teeth on, on this program, this farm-based program in grower finisher swine, and I'll tell you the reasons for that um, as we get through the presentation. Um, but we did roll out broiler poultry uh, farm surveillance last spring, uh, in April 2013. And then I'll, I'll conclude with some comments on what we felt were uh, key points that uh, have contributed to sustaining this program, this volunteer um, uh, surveillance program over the uh, eight years we've had it running in swine. Um, I doubt that I'm going to get us caught up um, to the schedule, and, uh, but I do have some slides that, uh, that uh, highlight the outputs, that, especially um, on an antimicrobial use front, but I don't know that we'll have time for those. But I'm happy to share those with anybody who's interested later. Um, there were... Um, uh, probably two significant uh, events and reports that um, resulted in uh, the creation of, of CPARS. Um, and uh, in 1997, there was a consensus conference held in Montreal, um, and uh, the Controlling Antimicrobial Resistance Report came out of that meeting. Um, and then uh, several years later, uh, Health Canada um, struck a committee, an advisory committee, um, that was to look at, it was chaired by Dr. Scott McCune, who many of you probably know, um, uh, that was to uh, assess the uh, impact of antimicrobial use in food animals on, um, on human health. Um, both of those reports had uh, recommendations around the development of a national surveillance program for antimicrobial uh, resistance and use with specific recommendations for farm-based use surveillance and monitoring. So, um, over that time, uh, CPARS was born, the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance. Um, the founding uh, director is still our director, Dr. Rebecca Irwin. And this is a collaborative, a collaborative uh, a program that cuts across um, uh, several federal agencies, um, Health Canada, the Veterinary Food Directorate, CFIA, Agric Agriculture Canada, and, uh, but we also rely heavily on collaboration from provincial ministries of agriculture and health academia, and of course, private industry, as you'll see in a moment. Um, we coordinate this program out of our office in Guelph. Um, we uh, are all uh, veterinarians by training with postgraduate training in either epidemiology or veterinary microbiology. And we've all had uh, spent varying amounts of time in, in practice. Um, and luckily, we, we seem to cut across the major core commodities of interest for CPARS. Well, very quickly, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch on um, the different components of CPARS, uh, but suffice to say that um, this is a multi-pronged surveillance program uh, that uses both passive and active surveillance methodologies to collect uh, use and resistance data. Um, you can see, for instance, uh, there was reference made to IMS. We, too, purchase IMS data on the human side, um, along with some other databases. Uh, so that I would classify as, as passive data, I guess. Um, but uh, the focus of this talk is uh, primarily on the development of our, of our farm programs. And um, what is obviously, to state the obvious, uh, unique about this program, it's the only place where we can get end user data um, um, for, uh, to compare to the resistance data that we get at retail, abattoir, and of course from our farm surveillance programs. So just before we get to the objectives, um, this, uh, uh, our farm program uh, received funding uh, in 2003 uh, under the Agriculture Policy Framework funding that was uh, managed by Agriculture Canada. Um, that uh, funding call was really all about sustainable agriculture. And under the uh, food safety pillar, there was um, antimicrobial resistance was cited as a research priority. So we made a proposal uh, to uh, use this money to pilot um, farm-based surveillance we were lucky in procuring that funding, and so um, it was 3.3 million over five years. Um, and it sounds like a lot of cash, but uh, those of you who have even flirted with this uh, concept of on-farm surveillance, you know that that doesn't really go a long way, depending on, on how you're going to structure it. Um, so obviously the first um, uh, uh, bit of business we had to get down to was establishing a national infrastructure that would uh, provide data that, uh, for trend analysis and antimicrobial use and resistance. 
Um, yes, we'd like to be able to investigate associations between farm use and resistance, and we are one of those countries that are still very descriptive, at a very descriptive level so far at that. We, we have looked at uh, other um, uh, mathematical methods, everything from Bayesian modeling uh, to more conventional uh, modeling, but we still haven't settled on anything that's satisfactory. So we are uh, involved with uh, some bilateral meetings uh, through Carolee Carson and Craig Lewis's group uh, working together on, on this front. Um, and ultimately, we have done contributed data to some human health risk assessments. So we, we had the money, we had the mandate to um, develop this program, um, and so was, um, I was asked by uh, Dr. Irwin to, to lead this uh, farm initiative. Um, so the first thing I did uh, um, was to uh, uh, hit the road, or more, more to the point, um, hit the, uh, the airways, and uh, I went from coast to coast across Canada, uh, meeting with uh, different uh, uh, commodity groups, both um, national organizations and, and um, provincial organizations, ministries of agriculture and ministries of health. And uh, when you have 3.3 million um, kind of in your pocket, it, it opens doors you don't normally get to go through. Um, but anyway, that, that, what I did find out um, uh, pretty quickly uh, was that uh, we had a bit of a deficit in the old trust account um, with a lot of these um, organizations. We were viewed as big government. Remember, we were Health Canada at the time, uh, not an agency that uh, specifically producer groups or veterinary groups were used to seeing come on, wanting to come on farm. Um, and uh, they, you know, they were used to thinking of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency veterinarians or, or Agriculture Canada, but definitely not Health Canada. So there was a, a, quite a concern there. Um, obviously, everybody in this group understands that, uh, but especially back in 2003, this was a contentious issue. Um, we were going to be challenging existing management practices. This wasn't necessarily on, on people's radar. Um, if you uh, may or may not recall, in 2003, we just had a BSE outbreak in Alberta, and uh, that following spring, uh, in 2004, um, our broiler industry in British Columbia experienced an avian flu outbreak. So. Um, we didn't give them a pass. We still went to see those people and, and they said, well, um, maybe not right now, but uh, definitely we recognize this as an, as an issue. And it's interesting, the beef industry said the one thing the BSC outbreak showed us was that um, we, have to, we have to be able to address all these issues that are, um, that are, that are sitting there in the background and, and uh, be able to manage those and get out in front of them. So um, the other... Uh, issues that, uh, that we heard loud and clear, the anxiety, fear, mistrust was often around um, data confidentiality, farm biosecurity, and, uh, and how we were gonna report findings from the surveillance program. Um, and they were also concerned about the time investment that uh, it would take to conduct uh, a farm uh, visit, for instance. So how are we gonna deal with this uh, deficit in trust? based on a, a, a volunteer uh, data uh, collection model. So after these uh, multi-commodity uh, meetings uh, nationally, we struck an internal uh, working group within CPARS, a uh, four, four-person uh, working group. We, uh, our kind of our marching orders were that this was to be a, uh, this program was supposed to be national in scope, uh, ideally multi-commodity, um, and a, a Sentinel farm uh, network by design. Uh, we quickly found out, though, that given the, the money that was available, that we probably weren't going to be able to do a good job, at least at a pilot phase, um, doing um, more than one commodity. Uh, so we, we actually uh, went with the um, uh, gore finisher, the, the swine industry. Uh, why the swine industry? They, hadn't, uh, they had a, probably of all the commodities in, at that time. They had the most mature uh, quality assurance program, their CQA program. Um, they had not... Uh, experienced a recent uh, foreign animal disease out outbreak. So they weren't dealing with that. And the CAVS program, which um, uh, was active at that time, had piloted um, uh, their uh, program in, in, in swine. So we thought that that was uh, another good reason to, to try and launch our pilot uh, in that sector. Um, we, and, and a lot of my comments about how we developed this, pro this program and the process we went through was uh, repeated uh, in, in our broiler uh, poultry uh, consultations. 
So the first thing we did is we um, struck, we, as a working group, we, we came up with um, uh, kind of a straw dog, but it was really more like um, a bunch of headings of what we felt were the important components or elements of an on-farm surveillance program. Um, we struck a 10-member expert review panel. It was made up of um, uh, those who had, uh, who had specialization either in the swine industry or the AMR file. Uh, they were uh, often min uh, Ministry of Agriculture veterinarians, um, but there was representation from commodity groups. And uh, also, we also had one uh, medical officer of health on that 10-member uh, panel. So we, we kind of took a Delphi approach. It was very uh, much a clean slate at the beginning, but uh, with every iteration, we pressed the, the panel to come up with some concrete recommendations that, that could be put in front of a, a larger uh, working group or advisory committee. Um, so the, the third draft of, uh, of our framework document, and this, this, uh, this process right to this point uh, took about a half a year. Um, to, most of the meetings were uh, by conference call, uh, but when we got to this working group level, we did have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and we, we took this third draft, we went through it uh, point by point over a two-day meeting, and then out of that came this implementation framework and a lot of the tweaking on uh, the uh, practical aspects of the uh, sampling kit design and questionnaire development uh, was left to a, a subcommittee of producers and veterinarians. So these were the, um, the recommendations that came out of that process. Uh, we developed inclusion exclusion criteria for recruitment of herds uh, as sentinel sites. Um, and that recruitment was, uh, those were instructions provided to veterinarians um, who, who, did, uh, who ended up, as you can see, did the field work um, herd veterinarians were recommended as the most trusted group uh, to conduct this work uh, for reasons that they, it was felt that they could uh, hold data confidential, act as a confidentiality screen. They understood and would respect the biosecurity protocols uh, spe spe specific to each uh, participating uh, farm. Um, and we did compensate, uh, again, respective of their, their time investment, we did provide compensation uh, to producers and veterinarians uh, that was commensurate with veterinary fee guides and, and uh, that recommendation came from uh, one of the producer organizations. And to this day we continue to uh, compensate um, uh, producers and vets for their participation. Um, the sampling is composite pen samples and from those samples, um, depending on the commodity, we uh, both broilers and, and swine programs we isolate uh, generic E. coli, uh, salmonella, um, and campylobacter is in the broiler program only. Again, in an attempt to harmonize with activities at NARMS, we are using the Sensitizer system and the NARMS public health uh, panel. The questionnaire uh, is where we collect our antimicrobial use data. So on a sampling day, a questionnaire is applied um, where we collect antimicrobial use uh, data. And around, around that, um, again, I in the limited time, uh, suffice to say that we do collect uh, information, more quantitative information on the feed, antimicrobial use, and uh, more qualitative information on water and, and uh, injectable. But we do collect reasons for use, um, inclusion rate or dosage, um, and uh, we, for all three routes of administration, we, get, we have an estimate of the exposure, uh, the number of pigs or, or birds exposed. Um, of course, her demographic, pig inventory, and animal health information are also collected through those questionnaires. Um, the communications process was uh, a topic of um, uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion um, at the advisory committee, but it distilled down to actually a, a fairly simple um, protocol. Uh, we have an agreement that we will provide the industry with a, a two weeks notification prior to any publication or a presentation such as this of any new data from a, a, a given sampling year. And that seems to have worked uh, to this point. It provides them an ample opportunity to uh, get their media lines in place, but truthfully, the swine industry is pretty boring. It's a lot of flat lines and uh, uh, that's maybe the message. Um, well, it, and, but I, if time permitted, I could show you that they're not all flat lines. And, uh, I enjoyed the, the comment this morning about variation in use. Uh, does that equate, uh, we don't know what we're doing? Well, that, you know, it's one interpretation. So this is what we rolled out. Um, and it was, uh, there were two types of herds in the initial rollout. 
Uh, regular herds were sampled three times a year, um, and we separated, we broke the year out into three sampling um, seasons uh, to, to reflect the three turns of a, the average uh, grow finish barn. Um, the cohort herds, that was about a, a subset of about 30% of herds that, um, where we asked them to take one of those uh, sampling periods and uh, sample uh, hogs that were entering the grow finish area and they were resampled again um, at uh, close to market. So we rolled this program out and uh, it's interesting, we lost the color in Ontario and Quebec. But anyway, um, the, uh, this, uh, the, the five major pork producing provinces, um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec, um, it, it represents um, not 80% of the uh, produ pork production in our, our country. Um, and we rolled this out proportional to the number of grow finish units in each province. But it wasn't long after implementing um, the, uh, the program that we started to see some problems with compliance um, and uh, which were, we felt, related to how we rolled uh, the program out. Uh, this was our first outing uh, this kind of, with this uh, kind of a national program. Um, and um, and our, our data collection instrument in terms of the uh, questionnaire design was uh, pretty extensive and a lot of questions weren't getting uh, answered at all or, prob or poorly. So in 2007, we, uh, we went through a refinement uh, where we streamlined the, the questionnaire, the sampling kits uh, became very turnkey and, and we really um, haven't looked back um, since that point. That, that's generally worked quite well um, um, from a, a, a compliance standpoint. So the first refinement was based on feedback from the field. In 2009, we, uh, we had two years of data. We were able to look at the data and see the and did, uh, variance component analysis and recognize that there was variation at the farm level, but um, um, that, that, that we weren't seeing a lot of temporal changes in terms of use and resistance within a given year. So um, we, we modified the program to go to one sampling per year. We maintained the same number of samples per herd per year by going to six pens um, and administer the, the, qu the questionnaire, which was, I had a few uh, tweaks made to it at that point but really was unchanged. And we dropped the cohort sampling because uh, from a surveillance standpoint, it wasn't really contributing a lot of uh, additional information. Similarly, in the uh, broiler poultry program, um, again, we're, we're on the farm. We're not uh, sampling back at the hatchery, but we are uh, collecting samples um, or collecting antimicrobial resistance samples from the chick pads that come in on the crates. Um, and this is a very important industry because in our our uh, industry in Canada, they want to be able to discern what's coming in from the hatchery and what's um, resident flora in the farm, in, in the barn uh, that's receiving those chicks. So uh, we're in our second year of this program. We're going to maintain um, that approach uh, through this year and then, and then reassess. Um, but again, a, a questionnaire is applied where we collect antimicrobial use data, biosecurity, um, and other information on the flock. This program um, was rolled out in a little bit of different profile, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, uh, Ontario, and Quebec, and we have uh, uh, some flocks that are sampling, uh, given some extra funding in Saskatchewan, but basically those four provinces, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and Alberta would, would represent, again, 80 to 90% of our broiler production. So um, to summarize, we, um, we, we recognized we, we had a bit of a credibility issue and again, a, a trust uh, uh, issue with uh, what was gonna be largely a, a volunteer data uh, provision uh, based model. So um, as I just described to you, we took a very transparent, um, inclusive or consultative um, approach uh, to the process um, with the, the consultations that I've described uh, we, we went with uh, the recommendations that came out of that process, uh, veterinary field work, compensation for vets and producers, um, and we, uh, we received feedback on, the, on uh, practical elements and, and things that would make the protocols more efficient. Um, the pre-publication notification seems to have worked to date, as I mentioned. Probably the, so that, that's what got us to the point of implementation and, and able to sustain it through the early years. 
But one thing that we, uh, we really feel uh, is important in, in if you're developing this kind of program um, is that it need, you need to be very nimble and responsive to, to feedback and to the data that you're seeing coming out of the program. Um, so uh, looking at findings, feedback, and data quality, keep one eye on those things will contribute hugely to sustainability, but it, it ultimately builds trust. When you're, um, people doing the field work and industry sees that uh, um, you're not changing the message, we're not changing any kind of uh, message in terms of what the findings are out of the system, but uh, things that, may, that contribute to sustainability um, are, are definitely linked to trust. So on that point, these, this is Stats Canada data on um, uh, farms reporting hogs between 2000 and 2010. Um, our hog industry did go through some contraction, as you can see in that uh, period. And, and I can tell you that the number of, of hogs, the number of pigs, um, uh, did decline, especially in the last five years uh, through the recession. There were uh, several things that conspired against the industry, um, and, um, uh, but we've been able to maintain 90 to 95 herds uh, through this period, um, so we feel that uh, the process was right. So to summarize, uh, we've got ongoing surveillance in grower finisher swine and broiler poultry at the farm level for antimicrobial use and resistance. Um, we are going to be expanding to other commodities, primarily in beef in Alberta. And these, these, uh, these ex this expansion is related to our collaboration with FoodNet Canada system, um, where we've been uh, tasked as of two years ago to uh, implement their agricultural or farm-based component to that program. And so uh, we're going to be expanding to uh, cow-calf and feedlots in Alberta. That's already started. Um, we'll be uh, conducting uh, surveillance, farm-based surveillance in the dairy industry, um, where again, where it's, uh, where it's concentrated, turkey and layers as well in British Columbia and Ontario. So the outputs from this program, uh, we can provide uh, trend data, both temporal and, and spatial or regional um, uh, data on uh, antimicrobial use and resistance. And we could talk about uh, different metrics, and, but right now, um, there's a, you'll see a lot of our report, uh, the 2013 report, is based on farm uh, frequencies of use, and our quantitative data is still at the grams of active ingredient, but there are, uh, in our integrated section, there are um, calcul estimates based on population corrected units. And eventually, um, we may end up, end up reporting um, uh, animal daily doses. Um, we do try to integrate our data as best we can across CPARS components and the uh, different uh, industry and commodity sectors.